Amen. Well, good morning, church fam. How are we doing? Good, good. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Brandon. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, I do want to say a special welcome to our Two Notch Church family. Uh, it has been such a pleasure uh, to have a joint gathering today, and I'll consider it one of the blessings of the COVID era, getting to do a joint gathering this morning. Uh, so glad that you guys are with us. Um, I want to talk to you today about a potentially undiagnosed problem, uh, and marriage is going to be the backdrop of the conversation today. And the reason that this problem is potentially undiagnosed is because it surrounds a confused and contentious topic in our culture, and each of us have unique histories and experiences that we can't help but lay on top of everything we hear about this topic. So I told you guys last week that the title of this sermon is Passive Men and the Women Who Resent Them. Passive Men and the Women Who Resent Them. Sounds interesting, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I will say that the title is more aggressive than the sermon, so don't uh, be too afraid. Um, and just so you know, everything I say today is from the perspective of a participant in the problem. I have no semblance of a high horse here. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Open your Bibles up to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to need to do a good bit of work, uh, so buckle up. Uh, we've got some things I think we need to cover uh, to get the big picture. So if you uh, would pray with me as we open God's Word. Uh, Father, we need your help this morning. I know that I have nothing in and of myself to, to sustain uh, the souls that are gathered here. I pray that you would speak supernaturally through your Word in ways that only your Spirit can. I pray that you get me out of the way and and speak directly to hearts and give us insight and wisdom and clarity through uh, a very confused and contentious topic. Uh, please help us in all the ways we need it. We love you. Amen. All right, let's read God's word. Genesis 1, starting in verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image, and the image of God he created them. Male and female, he created them. So God creates humanity in his image. We are the apex of God's creating work. And God sought to fill the world with beings who look and act and operate like he does, so he did so with us. But the author of Genesis doesn't just paint in broad strokes. He doesn't stop at mankind or a generic humanity. Rather, he drives in on the specifics. He says, male and female, he created them. So who looks like God? We do. That's right, we do. He does and she does, we do. Who is made in the image of God? Us, we are, yes. He is and she is. So there's an equality of dignity found here with male and female. There's an equality of personhood. Neither is less than the other. That can't possibly be so because that would be saying certain parts of God are more important than the other. And that, of course, is foolishness. So there should be mutual respect between the genders. Men and women should recognize the unique aspects of the image of God in each other, be zealous to honor and respect each other. And within that unquestionable equality of dignity and personhood, God makes a distinction between the two genders. He says male and female. If you're familiar with the narrative leading to this point, you know that God has been making all kinds of distinctions between created things. He divides light and dark, Sky and sea, heavens and earth, land and water, night and day. Each part of creation is distinct, yet complements its counterpart. In the creation of human beings, God yet again distinguishes by creating male and female. They're equal in value as image bearers, yet different in form and function as male and female. They are like the rest of creation, complementary counterparts. So don't miss this. Our distinctiveness as male and female lies at the heart of what it looks like to mirror the image of God in the world. Both male and female are a good and necessary part of being made in God's image. There's a quality with distinction. So let me challenge some of you for a second here. Please don't lie about the Bible to try to accomplish a good goal. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, in the creation of mankind, God creates and then distinguishes by creating male and female. You're being dishonest if you read all of this and you say, light and dark, sky and sea, heavens and earth, land and water, night and day, but then male and female, there's really no difference between those. They're really irrelevant. Those are the same. That's nonsense. And I don't care how strong the cultural tides are to try to get you to say or believe that. It's foolishness. A main theme of this passage is the distinguishing work of God. 
If your goal is to eliminate the mistreatment of women, that's a wonderful goal, amen? God is the captain of that team, and the Bible is on that team, and we should be too. But don't lie about the Bible in order to accomplish that good goal. The reason I want to eliminate the mistreatment of women is because of the Bible. God has made male and female in his image, and image bearers must not be mistreated. Amen? No matter their size or gender or anything else. Flip over to Genesis 2, and we'll zoom in on some particular moments of creation, starting in verse 14, uh, 15. It says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. From the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. So God puts Adam in the garden and gives him a calling. He gives him something very meaningful to give the full weight of his energy to. Just work it and keep it. God makes him responsible for the garden. And part of this responsibility was obeying one very specific command. Don't eat from this tree. God gives him authority to name the animals just like God's speech created the earth. Adam's speech was to create and cultivate. And then God creates Eve and basically says they will team up in this calling. The Hebrew word translated as helper is the word ezer, and it's much more compelling than the English word for helper. That's one where some meaning is lost in translation. A picture it paints is one of supporting strength, of bringing lacking but necessary strength to bear. And God himself is called an Ezer multiple times in scripture. For example, Psalm 33 verse 20 says, Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help, our Ezer, and our shield. So scripture says they come together as husband and wife. They're naked and unashamed. And now what happens, what happens in Genesis 3 as we read this, I want you to think about the dynamic between Adam and Eve here. Chapter three, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now remember, God gave the command not to eat from the tree only to Adam. And also notice that neither shall you touch it, is actually an addition. God didn't actually say that part. He just said, don't eat. So they could have presumably built a treehouse in it, <laughs> just not eat it. Verse four, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You can't hear him because he's in the background of the story, but Adam is with her in this moment. And in this moment, the man whose speech named the elephant and the aardvark suddenly can't find his vocal cords. Verse six. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So all at once, right here, everything that Adam was responsible for comes crashing down. I don't want you to notice the inversions that take place here. Adam was supposed to have dominion or leadership over the creatures, and here that's inverted, and a creature now has dominion over Adam. Adam was supposed to have dominion over the garden, but now a fruit has dominion over him. Adam was supposed to lead his wife forward into God's calling, but now she is leading him. Think of the ways that he might have engaged here. 
when the serpent tried to confuse Eve by saying, did God really say? Adam could have stepped in and said, yes, yes, he did. I was there. Amen? When the serpent said, uh, you will not surely die, he could have said, yeah, we will. Surely. Surely, that's exactly what God said. And I'm the one he said it to, so move along, talking snake. But he did none of those things. Instead, here's what happened. Adam stepped back. He was silent when he should have spoken up. He was apathetic when he should have fought. He stepped back when he should have stepped forward. He abdicated his responsibility that was given to him by God. He could have stepped in and said, okay, everyone, I don't really understand exactly what's happening here, but I know it's not good. I need everyone to take a step back for a second and let's think. But he doesn't give his voice. He doesn't lend his body, his strength, his energy, his protection. He's calm, passive, reserved, and in the background. Eve, on the other hand, what did she do? She steps in. She reached out and took control. So Adam steps back. Eve steps in. Does that pattern sound familiar to anyone? Maybe in our marriages, potentially? Maybe. I'll tell you this. Many, not all, but many men in my life group and in our church, uh, struggle with apathy. I would argue that it's our most besetting sin as men, including myself. Many, not all, but many women in my life group and in our church are overwhelmed. Generally speaking, men tend to struggle with passivity. And generally speaking, women tend to struggle with control, manipulation, or overly inserting themselves and they end up overextended and overwhelmed. This pattern has become so prevalent that it's almost expected in families. Dad steps back, and the mom steps in. Dad is so uninvolved that he's clueless and honestly irrelevant. Mom keeps stepping in and running everything and dad is just kind of glad to let it happen. If anyone is leading the family spiritually, it's mom. The wife is engaged with life group. The husband is just there. And I would argue that our culture actually reinforces this. It is expected that mom will lead the family and that dad won't get in her way or act like he could possibly have input that is needed or much less be responsible for the family. He steps back, she steps forward. This is the air we breathe. Let's pick back up in verse seven. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? So notice, who does God call out first? Adam. Why? He was responsible. God goes to the one he gave responsibility to. And that's a meaningful point because notice that Satan reversed the order. Satan went to Eve. But when God shows up, he goes straight to Adam and he reaffirms his created order by going to the counterpart he gave responsibility to. What happens next is that Adam blames Eve, Eve blames the serpent, and both would experience profound consequences from Adam's passivity and Eve's over-insertion. Notice the curses or consequences starting in verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. 
I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is what's sometimes called the first gospel or the first mention of what God will do to fix this. One from the woman will crush you, meaning Jesus, and what a beautiful promise that is. God says it's going to require the gospel of Jesus to reverse the mess that was just created. All the death, the war, the beatings, all the abuse, all of it comes from this moment and only the finished work of Jesus can begin to sort it out and it will. To the woman, he said, surely I will multi surely multiply your pain and childbearing in pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Rule there is not a benevolent word. So God says to Eve, your problem was that you stepped out from authority. So authority will be a real problem for you. You are going to want to control, but not be able to. And sure enough, everywhere you go, Childbirth is painful, and men mistreat and abuse women. The curse came true. Verse 17, And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you were dust, and to dust you shall return. So to Adam, God says, since your problem was passivity, I'm not going to let you survive unless you step forward and sweat. No more sitting back. If you want to eat, there will be sweat on your brow. The ESV Study Bible uh, provides the co following commentary to better explain what happened in these curses. This will be on the screen. You can read along with me. These words from the Lord indicate that there will be an ongoing struggle between the woman and the man for leadership in the marriage relationship. The leadership role of the husband and the complementary relationship between the husband and the wife that were ordained by God before the fall have now been deeply damaged and distorted by sin. Eve will have the sinful desire to oppose Adam and to assert leadership over him, reversing God's plan for Adam's leadership in marriage. But Adam will also abandon his God-given pre-fall role of leading, guarding, and caring for his wife, replacing this with his own sinful, distorted desire to rule over Eve. Thus, one of the most tragic results of Adam and Eve's rebellion against God is an ongoing, damaging conflict between husband and wife in marriage, driven by the sinful behavior of both and rebellion against their God-given roles and responsibilities in marriage. Huh. So the reality is some of the tension and frustration and conflict in our marriages today actually goes all the way back to the beginning of time. But in the fullness of time, Jesus came to redeem those under the curse of sin and the curses it brought. He means to bring us back to the original dream and design for marriage. Amen? Amen. So in the New Testament, we have commands for Christian marriages that actually hearken back to the design of male and female, showing off the image of God in complementary ways in marriage. But if you don't understand this pattern, then part of what the New Testament says about marriage will, will be confusing, if not offensive to you. The primary passage about marriage roles in the New Testament is Ephesians 5. So flip there now, and with all of what we've already covered as the backdrop, let's look at uh, what Paul has to say here. Ephesians 5, starting in verse 22. He says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. 
For us, this is the part that sticks out like a sore thumb. For the original audience, where men had far more power than women, this would actually have been more normative and expected, and the next part would have stuck out more to them. Verse 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So in a culture where men had most of the power, this would have been far more confrontational than the first part. It would have been like a a bucket of ice water to the face for some of these men. Reminds me of a story of a friend of mine who went to a part of India uh, years ago, and he went to a a local church in this part of India he was in, and the pastor was preaching from this text. And he said when the pastor uh, read the part about wives submitting to their husbands, the pastor said, of course we all know that this is good and right and true. And I don't even need to say anything else about this. And then when he got to the part about husbands sacrificially loving their wives, he started getting all this fear and trepidation in him, like he was nervous about what to say. And he went on to say things that my friend was like were utterly common sense. There's no reason that you need to say any of them. And when he left the gathering uh, with the host family that he was with, the family was like, man, I'm so proud of my pastor for taking a stand on this. We're going to have people that leave our church because of what he, what he said today. And my friend was like, what universe am I living in? This is wildly different. But here's another, Colossians 3.18. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. There's another verse uh, where Peter says, uh, basically the idea that if you want your prayers to be answered, husbands, don't, don't be harsh with your wife. No no mixed mixed words about this in the New Testament. And all this is reversing the curse. Wives, submit to your husbands. Follow his leadership. Husbands, love your wives as yourself and do not be harsh with them. Honor your wives. Treat her as you treat your own body. Sacrifice for her as Christ sacrificed himself for the church. And because these concepts have so much potential for confusion in our culture, I want to simplify as much as possible. So here is the most helpful breakdown of what these passages are and are not saying that I've heard. Uh, I have a little chart for you that kind of lays out the biblical design for roles in marriage. Starting with the husband, uh, he is called to loving, humble responsibility. It means it's ultimately on you, husband, to make sure your wife, marriage, and family are healthy. It means you make sure it's getting done. It means you steer toward decisions that are best for your family, not just for yourself. It means you lead with your words and your example. This does not mean you do everything or decide everything. It means you are responsible for what gets done and what gets decided. The wife, on the other hand, is called to joyful, intelligent submission in this design. Notice that if the husband is doing his part, the concept of submission gets a whole lot easier, right? She is not to leave her brain or voice at the altar. She is to bring all of her wisdom and giftedness and strength into the marriage. And the wife is called to follow her husband's leadership joyfully as he tries to lead the family to honor God. Now on to the errors. For the husband, the error of dominance is to be a tyrant. To be domineering, lording his position of authority over his wife, taking advantage of it, sinfully enjoying the power trip that comes with it. The tyrant runs amok like some sad king who finally has a small kingdom he can rule over. He wants everyone to serve him and may ensure that's the only choice they have. On the other hand, the passive error for men is to be a coward, to be silent when you should speak, 
to know things that need to change in your marriage or family, but you don't want to rock the boat. So you just keep it to yourself and you turn to your hobbies. Being a coward is all about abdicating your responsibility to lead and protect. So like Adam, when the enemy comes, you are either too preoccupied or too foolish to see it. Now, culturally speaking, I want you to answer this out loud. Which one is our society more worried about for men? The tyrant. The tyrant. Our culture is more concerned about tyrant men. It drips off of our lips and the way people talk derogatively about the patriarchy. The dreaded M word, men. Men. Our culture's attempt to diagnose this side of the chart is the term toxic masculinity. And it absolutely is a problem. Tyrant men have done indescribable amounts of damage, and their trails of destruction are usually very visible. When a man uses his energy to take instead of give, to harm instead of bless, that causes tremendous harm that often lasts through generations. But the interesting thing is we don't have the same terms or nowhere near the same amount of fear for the opposite error in men. There are no slogans to warn of the dangers of the men, husband, and fathers who were just there. This is largely because the damage that uh, cowards cause is typically far less visible The damage cowards cause is like that of Adam, who steps back from his wife, who's in spiritual danger because it's easier. Who, when confronted, says it was her fault. That discrepancy is interesting to me because of this. If I had to guess, and it would be purely a guess, I would say that maybe one out of ten of you would say that your dad was more of a tyrant that he was overly aggressive to the point of being controlling and maybe even abusive. And there are some of us who would say that, generally speaking, our dad's got it right. And I would imagine all of the rest would say their dad was more passive. He was there, but he was honestly irrelevant. Dad may have worked hard to pay the bills, but he probably didn't have vulnerable conversations with you. Yeah, he was at the dinner table, but he didn't lead you into what it meant to be an adult. Mom ran the family and kept everything going, and if something was going to change, it was because mom brought it up, not dad. And because mom saw the change through, not dad. If the family did anything spiritual or discipleship-oriented, it was mom who drove it, not dad. It was mom who decided if and when you go to church services. And generally speaking, dad just tried to keep mom happy and do what she wanted. The damage that comes from that may be less overt than the tyrant. But many of the wounds and deficits we've discussed earlier in the series result from passive, cowardly fathers. All right, you guys ready for the errors of the wives? Let's do that. On the right side, we have usurper. We don't use that word a ton, so I want to define it quickly. A person who takes a position of power illegally or by force. Usurpers are the women who are more than glad for their husband to take a back seat and who, in all honesty, would challenge his every move even if he didn't. A usurper is resistant to her husband, hostile toward the very idea of his competency and leadership, even if that's not a conscious awareness. And usually, even if a usurper enjoys and prefers this role, deep down, there's still a simmering resentment against the weak man she's married to. On the other hand, passive women are doormats. Day after day, month after month, year after year in their marriage, it's, yes, dear, whatever you say. Yes, dear, whatever you say. 
She doesn't contribute at all to the decision-making process. She has no preferences, no desires, no voice. She's a doormat. Now, on that spectrum, our culture, I would argue, is more concerned about the doormat side. That's where almost all of the fear and warnings are. That's what many are reacting from, largely because of sinful treatment of women in the past. But there's very little fear or caution on the other side of the spectrum with the usurper side. So all of this begs the question, which are you currently operating in? The biblical design or one of the errors? And of course, it's not always black and white. Many of us have a mixture of health and unhealth. And for folks who aren't married, uh, these are, verses are about husbands and wives, not men and women in general. But the tendencies are probably still there for uh, self-inspection. So men, are you passive, married or not? Are you a tyrant, married or not? Women, are you a doormat? Do you hesitate to express your thoughts and insights for fear of rocking the boat or out of insecurity? Or are you more tempted to overly insert yourself? A chart is simply to paint a picture, and you can see it played out in mirrored. Because when a tyrant is married to a usurper, there is conflict all the time. It never stops. Constant conflict. When a tyrant is married to a doormat, there can be all kinds of mistreatment or abuse. And it's dehumanizing for both of them. If a coward is married to a doormat, they never actually meaningfully engage anything out of fear of rocking the boat. And the result is two strangers who live together. And then when a coward is married to a usurper, usually there is simmering resentment in both of them until someone snaps until he gets sick of being a coward and has an affair. Until she finally drives him down into the small man she's trained him to be. And maybe she moves on to a different challenge. Now in every culture, there are parts of the Bible that sound wildly wrong. And I'm well aware that these passages are one of them for us. There are a few reasons for that, including the abuse of passages like these to excuse and condone sinful mistreatment of women. And I want you to hear me say this, that is deplorable and God will most certainly judge it. But in reaction, there are some who would say that Paul and others are just simply wrong. Others would say that it doesn't mean what it sounds like it says it means. And then generally speaking, a whole lot of other people would just ignore it altogether. And I would suggest to you that all of those are bad ideas that do not lead to good fruit or flourishing of our marriages. And my question is this, what if much of our resistance to this idea is actually culturally conditioned and the result of the fact that we largely react to bad examples? So what if we are a culture where the sins of tyrant men have been so well publicized that men are running away from that end of the spectrum as fast as we can, with everyone encouraging us to do so, and we ran right past the biblical design into being cowards? What if women have seen examples of doormat women in their histories and in their own lives? and throughout history, and what if they vowed to never, ever be treated like that? And what if you all run the risk of running right past the joyful, intelligent submission and marriage you were called to into the role of a usurper? In a crowd like this, I am sure there are a few tyrant men and at least a few doormat women I hope for, for you that you already know what some of your application may be. And if that's you, I would encourage you to uh, talk to your life group leader or find one of us pastors and we can talk more about your application for this. But to end, I'd just like to speak to the coward husbands and the usurper wives. We're going back to the sermon title 
to the passive men and the women who resent them. The biblical admonition I'll make to cowardly husbands and usurper wives comes from Ephesians 5.33, which says, However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So uh, men will start with us. To all men who are married or may be married one day and in danger of being on the passive side of this spectrum, I want you to know that we live in a culture where immaturity and adolescence get perpetuated. We have young men with Peter Pan syndrome, not wanting to grow up and take responsibility for themselves to cultivate relationships with others. Instead, we have men who shirk responsibilities, blame others for their immaturity, and are more adept at cultivating hobbies and games in their own actual lives. There may be nothing wrong inherently with the way that you spend your time, but if you are more adept at your hobbies than you are with engaging your wife and reading your Bible and connecting with your kids and making sure that things in your family need to change, change, that needs to begin to shift today. Because that is a passive way to live. It gives you no purpose. It dishonors your high calling in God, and it probably makes your wife resent you. You need to learn how to speak directly. This is what I think. This is what I feel. I disagree, and here's why. This is how I think we should handle the situation. What do you think? We have to risk putting ourselves out there, feeling exposed and vulnerable. We need to become aware of the pull on our souls to just sit back and see if someone else will take care of things so we don't have to. Man, your life should not be a drain on your wife or a drain on others around you. Instead, others should drain from your strength and responsibility. You are to be a source of energy and strength and protection and purpose and direction. A pastor named Robert Lewis once said, the boy and you must die. And as soon as I heard it, I knew exactly what it meant. We also honestly live in a culture where sometimes the message is that there's something wrong with men simply because we're men. That men are dangerous and a problem and we ruin everything. So I want you to hear, men, that you are needed. You are needed desperately. We need you to engage. We need you to have that necessary but tough conversation to initiate it. We need you to engage the problematic neighbor that needs to be talked to so your wife doesn't have to do it. We need you to initiate spiritual conversations with your wife, to be more forward with your relationship with God. We need dads to engage your kids' hearts. And honestly, half of us men in the room have wives who are more gifted leaders than we are. That's not what I'm talking about. That's fine. And if that's you, I would encourage you to pick your wife's brain early and often. Go to her as a resource. Let me give you an idea of how you could start if this is where you are. Ask yourself, what is an area of my marriage, family, or life that I would like to grow and be healthier? And then one day this week, tell your wife that you'd like to pray about it together. If she's on board with it, put your phone down, grab her hand, and pray about it with her. Then thank her for praying with you. That's a simple and beautiful start to what I'm talking about. You see a problem, you take responsibility for it instead of waiting to just see what will happen. And you initiate bringing needed change. That's the key. If something is wrong, don't sit back and wait on your wife to fix it. You step in, step forward, and take responsibility. And on the other side, to usurper wives, to those who lean more on that side of the spectrum. You may have heard this before, but it's almost impossible to understand how deeply true it is. Your husband would rather feel respected by you than loved. He would rather feel respected. Now, he wants both. No false dichotomy is necessary here. But out of all the nice things you could possibly say to your husband, such as, I enjoy spending time with you, I love you, etc., do you know what the most meaningful thing is you can say far and away? 
I respect you. I'm proud of you. You did a great job with that. He will take that every time over the alternative. One study of men I saw showed that 74% of men surveyed would rather feel lonely and unloved than inadequate and disrespected. Your husband's need for respect is that deep. It's primordial in a way that you may not even be able to understand. That's why Ephesians 5 says, men, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. And I think respect is what submission looks like in day-to-day life. Our culture says that love should be unconditional, but respect must be earned. That's not actually what the Bible says. In Scripture, respect is a command. Your husband needs to have your respect. If you want your husband to feel loved by you, show him that you respect him. If a man feels disrespected, he is going to feel unloved. If you refuse to respect your man, the Bible actually sides with him. God has sympathy for the husband whose wife refuses to respect him. A few quick Proverbs for you. Proverbs 21, 21, 19. Better live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and ill-tempered wife. Ill-tempered means grumpy, always bothered by something. Nothing you do is ever good enough. You can't please this type of wife. Proverbs 21, 9. Better to live on a corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. Quarrelsome meaning always picking fights, always wanting to argue, constantly making things into big deals, drama or nagging. Proverbs 27, 15. A quarrelsome wife It's like a constant dripping on a rainy day. Just keeps getting better, doesn't it? One of our deepest fears as men is to be found inadequate. It absolutely haunts us. And for the man with a nagging and usurping wife, that's what he's constantly feeling. Because we we operate around respect, a wife who is constantly nagging and correcting and controlling is emasculating. It's castration by critique. And it's hard to watch, honestly. When a wife resists her husband's attempts to help or lead, when a wife belittles her husband, when she emasculates him in front of others or especially in front of their kids, oh man, it is, it's like, watching a train wreck in slow motion because what she might not realize is that she's training her kids that they don't have to respect him either. God pities the husband whose wife doesn't respect him. That man can't win. He can't be a man and fulfill his role without his wife being angry or contentious. He can't lead. He can back down and lose or he can fight back and still lose. And I don't know if you know this, but I want to tell you how most men respond to that dynamic. We either rage out or honestly, more likely, just shut down. Most often, the man will just stop trying. He just shuts down. And sometimes we don't even know why we're shutting down. We can't articulate it. We're just angry and frustrated and feel like we can't win. These husbands eventually stop trying to set the tone. They start putting their energy towards work where they feel validated, where they can set goals and accomplish them, where they get positive feedback, or honestly, literally anywhere else where they can feel validated and get positive feedback. You want to know why some men play video games so much? Because they're good at them. Because they're good at them. Because of our soul deep need to be validated. And that's not a knock about about video games either. If I was good at them, I'd play them too, but I'm not. We desperately want to be good at things, to be affirmed at things. And when we don't feel adequate or affirmed in something, we won't do it. Some of my friends are really into grilling and and cooking. I'm not. And you want to know why? Because I'm not good at it. I'm not good at it. But I did just get a Blackstone grill a few months ago, and I cooked burgers this week on it for the first time. Yes. Yes. And my wife, Christy, said it was one of the best burgers she'd ever had. Yes. Amen. And I was like, honey, I'll grill for you every night. I got my spatula ready. You just tell me what you want. I'm ready. 
I mean, she's always liked my buns, but this was different. <laughs> oh, man, that was good. That was good. That was a little joke addition from the first gathering. So respect is like relationship fuel for a man. When a man's wife respects him, he feels like a man because she knows him best. And he often responds by living up to her respect and belief in him. Did you know that you as the wife have magical powers in that way? You have magical powers because you can say things in such a way that makes his shoulders go down. You can say, you are terrible at this. You always do this wrong. You never get this right. Do you want to try to fix the sink and then I'll call the plumber or you want me to just go ahead and call him now? And his shoulders are just going down, 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 down. But you also can speak to him away in a way that makes his shoulders raise. Did you know that? You can say, hey, I've, I've noticed this and I know the man I married. And the man I married is thoughtful and considerate so I just wanted to bring this to your attention in case you hadn't thought about this. And if you do that, he's already doing the thing you want him to do. He's running off to do it right now. He's already doing it. Now, as we talk about all of this, are there particulars and specifics about your marriage that I'm not addressing? Yes, there are. Is it more nuance needed than what I've said? Yes. Are there specific things about your marriage that you will need to account for? Absolutely. I'm simply trying to give the patterns and let you see what you notice and take it from there with the Spirit's help. And I'll leave you with just a quick story that I think gets at this idea. And I'll forewarn you, this is one of a handful of stories that I can hardly tell without crying. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, it just goes to show you how deeply this is ingrained in men. But there is an old uh, African-American pastor named E.V. Hill after decades of marriage to his wife, he was preaching at her funeral. And as you can tell, um, in that setting, a story chosen for uh, a funeral of your spouse of decades must be incredibly impactful and meaningful to you. So he told this story at her funeral, and he said that early on in their marriage, he lost his job. And so one day after being out and about looking for work all day, he comes home and he opens the front door and he sees that there's a candlelight dinner spread out on their kitchen table. And he's like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. What a, what a delight. You know, I get to come home to this. His wife had prepared this wonderful meal. They sat in the, in the candlelight and they talked and it was just wonderful. And as soon as they get finished eating, he gets up and he goes to the bathroom and he turns the light switch on and nothing happens. And he says, huh. So then he goes and he walks to another room and he flips the light switch on. Nothing happens. So this sense of dread breaks in on him and he walks back to his wife and he says, honey, did, did they cut off our power? And she said, yeah, they did. She said, we didn't have the money to pay the bill this month, but I didn't want to make a big deal out of it because I knew you'd take care of it. I knew you'd take care of it. And God will get us through this. So I just figured we'd have a nice candlelight dinner. So standing there, looking out over the crowd at his wife's funeral, he tells this story. And he says, you know, in that moment, she could have ruined me. She could have decimated me and said, what kind of man can't keep the lights on? But instead, what she did is that. And he ended the story, and he said, you know, she always made me feel like a man. What a beautiful picture of what that respect looks like. So husband, let's, let's step into the humble and sacrificial leadership roles that we were designed for. Quite frankly, our wives, our families, and our world is desperate for it. And wives, I invite you to extend respect to your husband 
and see if something deep in your soul changes from feeling like resentment to something far warmer. Please pray with me. Father, thank you so much for the, the beautiful truths we've seen in your word today. I know there's so much working against us to, to see them clearly. So I, again, I ask for your spirit's help and insight and clarity. Pray that you'd strip away all the, all the things in our minds that are not from you and are not of you about this topic and that you would fill our hearts and our minds with just the, the beautiful, compelling, motivating truth about your design. Again, we need your help. God, I pray that um, marriages would, would be able to take meaningful steps toward health. I know that, that making some of these changes is, is very tricky and complex. So I pray for grace to cover all of that. I just pray for your, your insight and your supernatural help. I love you. Thank you for Jesus. Amen.